Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 45, Roman Conclusions, Part 1. Last time, I looked at the Roman art of pantomime as the final part of my story of theatre in Rome. For this episode, I wanted to try to sum up the developments and progression of theatre in Rome, but I found it difficult to draw conclusions through the story in a way that gives a definitive view in a digestible form. That, I think, reflects the diversity and longevity of the theatre in the Roman period, Republic and Empire, but also, to some extent, the paucity of information left to us in many areas. So I changed tack, and I'm going to present to you the ten elements of Roman theatre that I feel represent that diversity most, and are the elements that I found most surprising or enjoyable or interesting, or all of those things, as I travelled through the world of the theatre in Rome. As you will see, it is a wide-ranging and diverse list, and it will serve, I hope, to sum up what is most interesting and important about the Roman theatre to us. I say to us because that view changes over time. Clearly, in some eras, what was most important was the language, specifically the Latin, whereas at other times, it was what the drama said about what the Romans were not, specifically from a religious point of view. That is, not moral in a Christian sense. Now that the Latin is for most of us unobtainable, and we have generally become more secular and more forensic in our view of the past, I believe we're taking a more dispassionate view of the beliefs and habits of past civilizations, and trying to understand them with judgment suspended. My views are certainly not definitive, and will no doubt change as I discover more in the future, but this is where they stand now, as I finish this particular trawl through Roman theatre. As is the way with top ten lists, I've tried to place my selection in some order, and I'm very happy and sure about the number one and number two, but for the others, well... If we were discussing these over a beer or a glass of wine or two, then we would likely change the order and argue about the relative merits of my choices. But I'm convinced that they all deserve their place. So, here is my top ten list of the Theatre of Rome, or the bottom half at least. Once again, there is much to say and sum up, so we have time for just the bottom half for now. So here is numbers ten to six of my top ten of the Theatre of Rome. Sitting at number 10 is Terence. His life story is a great tale in itself. The ex-slave of uncertain origins, but certainly a foreigner in the Roman mindset, raised himself on his own skills and natural talents, was resented by some, but praised and nurtured by others who clearly loved him greatly. Whatever the truth of exactly how much help he got in the writing of his plays, he, or he and his collaborators, found something new in Roman comedy, Sadly, he was doomed to an early and dramatic death, but his works were revered for centuries because of the clarity of his Latin. His artistic life seems to have been quite hard, mostly because of the way he was criticised in his own time for his use of his sources. Judging from the prologues to his plays, he took these criticisms to heart, suggesting a sensitivity that he could never quite shield against for all of the support that he supposedly had from people of artistic and political stature. This is perhaps why I found Terence, as a person, so engaging. Although we have few details of his life, it wasn't difficult to paint a picture of this clever yet uncertain young playwright, which is a situation that any aspiring creative can, I'm sure, still relate to. His plays are difficult for us, as much of the comedy relies on cultural ideas that are now quite alien to us, so they're not easily appreciated. Many of the jokes rely not only on Latin punning, but on the translation of the original Greek sources into Latin. Many jokes only work for those who are bilingual in Greek and Latin, which, of course, a big proportion of Terence's audience would have been, but it's a rare thing for us today. That alone makes his plays a bit of a struggle for us, and it's difficult to take them on without some serious study. But perhaps what earns him his place most of all is that he was an innovator of the form he was very conscious that he was working well into the life of a long tradition. We might now see him as the end of that tradition that started somewhere in a vague area of Greek middle comedy, but presumably he saw himself only as part of a long chain that would continue after his death. In the prologues where he reports the accusations of misusing his sources, he's rather defensive and seemingly resigned to the criticism. But in fact, in his plays, he continues to introduce new ideas – 
like the double plot lines, the blending of multiple old works into one new one, and the setting up of stock characters who turn out not to be quite what he or she seemed to be to start with. The concept of reinvention itself becomes a theme of his plays, particularly in the eunuchs, where the ability of characters to change is a major concept. Much of this is very subtle, although it may have been more obvious to its intended audience. One example of these changes is the way he treats religion and ritual in plays, the point being that he hardly ever mentions it. In Plautus and Seneca, the stage altar, which was a permanent presence in the Roman stage, is obvious and often incorporated into the action. In Terence, there is only one example of the altar being used by characters in the plays. We have to remember that sacrifice and other ritual offerings to the gods were a common and integral part of Roman life. This was not only true of public events of the day, but in the home too, where the household god sat in a niche or grander setting in the larger villas, and was venerated many times a day. It suggested that to a Roman audience, watching a play set in the domestic sphere, as all of Terence's plays were, the absence of any mention of the gods would have been very noticeable, and possibly marked the characters out as removed from the norms of society. For Terence, this was a significant statement made by the absence of expected norms, but for us, a subtlety that could be easily missed. And this perhaps explains why his plays are not universally loved in his own time. It's not so clear to us now because the plays are gentle comedies that appear to lack the bite of Plautus or the earlier Greeks, but they were innovative and significantly different from what had been produced before, as far as we can tell. Different enough to unsettle some of his contemporaries. It's suggested that some of the criticism may have been born from jealousy of his talent, but I don't think that this is so clear-cut given the slight amount of detail that has survived about his critics. It could be that some saw his work as stretching the bounds of acceptability too far and asking too many awkward questions about some of the basics of Roman society, such as religion and the role of the head of the family. Should we see Terence as a serious playwright who took what had become a moribund form and attempted to shake some life back into it? That is possible, but it may not have sat well with his Greek-loving supporters if they were really only concerned with promoting all things Greek. For what it's worth, I think there was a lot more to them than just that. And if we see Terence as operating as a catalyst for change within his genre, well, for me, that makes his plays infinitely more interesting to pick away at. Coming in close at number nine is Plautus. Because his influence stretched so far into the future, he is impossible to ignore when we study Roman comedy. But that, of course, is not the only reason that he has a place on this list. Neither is the fact that he is the main link that we have between Greek and Roman theatre, interesting as all the inferences we can draw from that may be. This highlights the fact that we have a lot of missing plays, and at the time Plautus was certainly not the only link back to Greek drama. Because his work survived, we have to work on the assumption that they were the best of their kind and were the most copied and therefore preserved. But this is an assumption, and one that will no doubt remain, barring unimaginably startling discoveries that may come in the future. It's important to remember that there were others working in the same field and the same genres, and they too were popular in their day, but sadly we will never hear their voices. But that said, there is much to enjoy in Plautus, especially from those of us interested in the working of the theatre. The term metatheatre has been used to describe his work because it is very self-referencing to the art and the act of theatre. The prologues acknowledge the artifice of the situation, and within the plays characters make knowing asides to the audience and make a joke of the conventions and heightened situations that the characters find themselves in. These were, of course, plays that were originally presented in the open spaces of the city to a gathered crowd who had either come with the intention of watching a play or had been enticed in by the antics of the prologue himself. The audience would have been in holiday mode, attending festivals that the performances were part of. But this is not just a casual audience. His use of metatheatrical references suggests that Plautus could expect his audience to be well-versed enough in theatre to appreciate the in-jokes and references. It's a small point, but indicates that theatre had a dedicated and probably large regular audience, even long before it moved into permanent buildings. What really stands out for me as I look back over the works of Plautus is the way his plays, for all their difficulties, can still speak to us today. Many of his characters' struggles can be expressed in very modern terms – loneliness, depression, low self-esteem, for example. 
These are all subjects that found new modes of expression in the 20th century and have become of particular concern in 2020 and 2021 as we've struggled with enforced social isolation to one degree or another. In a modern version of Plautus, we would be very concerned for the mental health issues displayed by the misanthrope or Lycidemus in Cassina. And let's not get started on the interfamilial relationships. Your favourite soap opera could learn a thing or two about dysfunctional families from Plautus. So yes, this is comedy, and characters are exaggerated, as are their trials and tribulations, for comic effect. But they still speak to the concerns of living a fulfilled and good life within family and societal bonds. These are the same ideas that stretch back to the Greeks, from which the plots and themes are borrowed and adapted, and they stretch forward to us today. But one big difficulty with Plautus is the roles he gives to women. The gender relations are clearly of their time, and the extreme misogyny of some of the male characters is difficult to take, even if we allow for the possible extremes required for comic effect. Where the female characters are stronger, they still end up in an unchanged situation outside the home, or they are dislikable for pimping their own daughters, or acting as deviously as their husbands. There is something rather bitter about the female characters, especially the older ones, which, as much as we might try to rationalise, makes them not very likeable characters. However, I think we have to take into account that these are domestic comedies for the general amusement of a large and diverse Roman audience. As such, they have to speak to types and situations that were common to most, if not all, of the audience, and had to be painted with a broad brush. The characters were intended to be grotesques that reflected and exaggerated some of the facts, the rights and the wrongs of Roman life. That opens up the question of what the expectations were about an audience's reactions to the larger-than-life characters. To use a Shakespearean example who owes a lot to Plautus, do we laugh at Falstaff, feel sorry for him despite his shortcomings, or agree that yes, sometimes we see some elements of his character in people that we meet in everyday life? I'm sure we can all think of comic grotesques who speak to a truth, but who are not expected to be believed as realistic. They are the character types that we still see often in modern situation comedy, and that part of the playwright's toolbox can be traced all the way back to Plautus. That is quite a legacy, and well deserved. At number eight, I've put the rather difficult area of the Roman inheritance from the Greeks, and I think it merits its place precisely because it is a difficult area. There are few contemporary records that show precisely where and when the Greek theatre influenced the Roman, but we can point to many individual examples of where that influence is apparent and collectively we can see that it was extensive and lengthy. The fable is that drama was introduced to the Romans by the Etruscans at a ceremony to give thanks for the ending of a plague in the city-state. We'll never know for sure if this is just a story to crystallise an origin myth or a real event, but it doesn't really matter. We don't need to know the precise circumstances. That the Etruscans created a version of Greek theatre and then brought it to Rome is supported by evidence on those very distinctive red and black vase paintings that they produced in large quantities. For people who didn't even leave us their language or any writing, they have an incredible artistic legacy via their influence on the Romans. But did the Romans really not have a form of drama before that? something that was perhaps part of religious ceremonies, as we think we see in ancient animism and shamanism. The suggestion is that sports and religion were all that they needed, and they had not thought of or felt the need for any sort of retelling of their own stories, and for that basic urge to mimic. Now, I find that hard to believe given evidence from other civilizations, but whatever the case, they at least seemed to take up the Greek Etruscan ideas quickly once they'd been introduced to them. Then moving forward, we find the Greek colonies on the Italian peninsula presenting Atalan farce, building theatres in stone, preserving their own cultural traditions and then influencing their new masters as the reach of Rome extended through the peninsula and eventually to Greece itself. You may remember the story of how Roman generals turned up at a Greek colony where the whole town was in the theatre and, resenting the disruption, they sent the would-be invaders away without serious consideration. The Romans were, according to the sources, very alien to the Greek colonists, and yet, once they had conquered the area, and then Greece itself, the Romans adopted, copied and adapted Greek ways with enthusiasm, rather than enforcing a uniquely Roman stamp on their new subjects. The Romans reused Greek myth for their own, renaming gods and changing them to suit their worldview. So there were deep-rooted commonalities between Greek and Roman. 
and who took what from whom and when they did it is often a tricky thing to be precise about. At times, cultural assets were exchanged and then, much later, passed back, changed but still recognisable. There are records of Greek actors touring Italy and getting to Rome and of plays being specifically presented in the Greek fashion. As I've mentioned, Greek was commonly spoken in Rome, with many citizens being bilingual in Greek and Latin, which must have greased the wheels of the journey of Greek culture to Rome. Even in the later Roman period, the Eastern Empire was first and foremost Greek-speaking, so that influence continues for centuries. So something about the Greek way of life and mindset, quite a lot of it in fact, appealed to the Romans, and they admired and then absorbed much, including the traditions of Greek theatre. The Greek playwrights, particularly Menander, were held in high esteem, and their plays were revived, translated into Latin, and adapted to changed Roman sensibilities to a degree. But the Greek originals were never forgotten, with characters being given Greek names and the settings being almost always in ancient Greece. That helped the plays by removing them from Rome and the people of the city so the audience could enjoy the play detached from any criticism it might contain of them, because these were about these funny Greeks and their strange ways from the past. The traditional Greek myths were retold with a Roman slant, Right to the end of Roman drama, we still have the influence from Greece, with Terence even meeting his end on a return journey from what was probably a fact-finding mission to Athens, so that he could get closer to the Greek masters. Was that influence, I wonder, such an anchor that it actually held back the development of a uniquely Roman theatre? I'm certainly left with the feeling that the Romans could have, should have, done so much more with theatre given their ability to innovate and the almost limitless funds they could have thrown at it. But for reasons that are many and complex, Roman theatre does not leave the mark in history that one might expect, and their debt to the Greeks is undeniable. So we come to number seven on the list, which is unashamedly an attempt to balance number eight and champion the Roman theatre's influence on the future. For this, we can identify three clear strands. As I've already mentioned, in comedy, the origin of the grotesque character can be seen in Plautus, and then refined to the domestic sphere in Terence, both inheriting much from the Greek, but adapting it to the Roman situation and sensibilities. Family conflict and fights that span the generations are commonly used to drive plot, and often multiple plots, in both their works. These techniques are still used today in drama, soap opera and situation comedies. Secondly, in both dramatists, we have the use of the street scene, which is usually in front of three houses with balconies. This was the interchangeable setting around which some conventions grew up, the town offstage to one side, the country offstage to the other, for example. Whether the play was presented in an adapted Greek outdoor theatre, or the temporary theatre, or purpose-built theatre, or in the marketplace or temple steps, the basic setting of the street in front of houses was the same. And this, for all its simplicity, was a brilliant innovation. It was versatile both in terms of the practicalities of setting up the stage and in the access it gave actors to entrances, exits, hiding places and levels. It could equally accommodate the servant listening in concealed, the messenger hurrying on and off, and even the fleeing murderess rescued by the gods. Interiors are never seen, and references to them and the rear of the houses where connecting passages were assumed still relied on the imagination of the audience. It's no coincidence that the same idea became adapted by the Tudor playwrights in England. The third strand is the works themselves, particularly those by Plautus and Seneca. Plautine stock characters, themes and plots get reused and reinvented as his works were rediscovered in the Renaissance and became part of Italian drama. This is then closely followed in England, where the pre-Shakespearean playwrights also reuse and rework his plays and characters. Because of that, and Shakespeare's own use of Plautus, the traditions get carried on through the centuries. Blend this with a modification of Seneca's passionate rendition of tragedy and other local influences, and we see the building blocks of Renaissance and Elizabethan drama. So, I would contend the heart of Roman drama was never quite lost and at the very least we should see it as a necessary stepping stone to later periods of drama. And having spent a whole episode looking at the links of Plautus and Seneca to Shakespeare, it would be remiss of me not to mention it again here. Their influence on the Elizabethan playwrights in England and in Europe is a pivotal point in the story of the development of theatre, 
And we can only imagine what might have happened in theatre had they not had access to the rediscovered Roman playwrights. That influence is found in subject matter, character types, storylines and the very structure of the plays as they adopted and then developed the five-act structure and the role of the prologue. In that episode, I described how the stock character of the Braggart Soldier was developed and adapted to become classic characters of the theatre, like Falstaff, who's just one example of this. The surge of creativity in the Tudor and Elizabethan periods had several catalysts, and not least the expanding wealth through exploration and exploitation of the expanding world, the drive for learning to create a middle class to manage the expanding empire, and the new diversity in religious thought, and there were many others. The rediscovery of thought and art from antiquity was a cornerstone of those developments, and for the dramatists in particular, opened up an alternative way to tell stories that was not based on religious epics or folk tales. I'm sure that I'll be digging into this much more deeply when we get to that period. There's a lot to discuss there, even without the preeminent position of Shakespeare in theatre history, and having some knowledge of what the Roman playwrights did and why they did it will certainly be useful when we get there. The Roman stages sit at number six for me. I've already mentioned them in this list in the context of the Roman inheritance from the Greeks and the Roman influence on the future, but I believe that they deserve a place in their own right. Although the scenery is always the same or very similar, the different phases of theatre building or the lack of theatre buildings for a very long time make the Roman stage itself one of the most innovative parts of Roman drama. The early stage, no more than a raised platform in an open field or in a marketplace, was developed from necessity. We don't know exactly how the visiting Etruscans staged their original performance, but the Roman version of that performance ended up in the corner of the Circus Maximus, probably as an interval entertainment and staged on a temporary platform. When theatre left the circus and went to town, the plank stage went with them. That move is yet another element of Roman history that's shrouded in mystery. Was it because the circus was too big and grand a setting for the plays that had developed? Were the crowds too big and too rowdy? Did the performers crave more intimacy or appreciation from a more select audience? We don't know, and the marketplace or temple steps would only, I suspect, have been a slight improvement. But the stage could be set up anywhere with enough space and performance could go ahead, usually opening with a prologue to call the audience in. The early Roman actors must have been hustlers, and one can imagine the pleading, taunting and cajoling that would have accompanied the setting up of the stage and whatever rudimentary props were used to represent the street scene. The stage could, we think, be quite large, and appropriate space would have to be chosen. Roman civic design suited this. Away from crowded residential areas, some of which were cheaply and crudely built tenement buildings, there were parts of the city with large open civic spaces between market stalls or in front of temples. That would have been a good enough setting for a performance trying to find an audience, but first gathering and then keeping that audience must have been hard, with many other distractions ever present and close by. And what a relief it must have been for actors and producers to be allowed a purpose-built theatre to trap their audience into, even if it did have to be taken down at the end of the festival that it was put up for. I think a pause to consider this is warranted here. I still find it a bit mind-blowing that the Romans built temporary theatres for such a long period of time and would not allow them to remain in place. Just to reiterate, these were not just stages with seating, but complete buildings, some several stories high, built of wood and stone and lavishly decorated. They held audiences in the thousands and could accommodate plays and spectacles with casts that could include hundreds of extras and large props. The money and effort spent on these temporary structures not only says something about the enormous wealth that Rome commanded, but for me remains one of the most startling facts about Roman theatre. We should also not forget the way Roman citizens outside of the city itself reused and rebuilt Greek amphitheatres to turn them into Roman theatres. The original theatres carved from the shape of the land were often extended upwards with a tier of seating added above their natural height. The stages refaced with marble, the orchestra spaces reduced, and the best seating added for the elites of the day. In themselves, there are fine examples of Roman design, engineering and understanding of acoustics. The island of Sicily is a great example, with two major Roman theatres on the island. 
The theatre at Taormina was first built by the Greeks in the 3rd century BCE. They took the natural amphitheatre looking out over the Ionian Sea and the cone of Mount Etna and extracted a further estimated 100,000 cubic metres of rock to complete the construction. The Romans renovated that theatre, expanded the seating capacity and then added columns and statues and, it speculated, some covering that extended to partially shade the audience from the sun. Nothing remains of the columns which were removed in the Middle Ages to be reused in current building projects, but a configuration of more than 20 columns in the reshaped Skeena has been surmised, all of which would have arrived by sea and been dragged up the steep path to the site of the theatre. Also on Sicily is the Theatre of Syracuse. It's older by a couple of centuries or so and much larger. By the late Hellenistic period, the seating area had a diameter of nearly 140 metres, with 67 rows of seats. The Romans modified this to a broader semicircle shape and added more access points. The theatre was again remodelled in the Augustan period, which is when the Skeena was adapted to the Roman style of stage, with three doors and columns. Further adaptations were made in the late imperial period to accommodate other forms of entertainment. Most likely in this case, this was for water-based games and spectacles, as there was another amphitheatre in Syracuse used for gladiatorial fights and animal baiting. Roman theatres have a long history even after the Greeks, and my advice is to never pass up the chance to visit a Roman theatre. They are always fascinating and very evocative places to spend some time in. And this is where we hit pause for the moment. I hope that this has been something of a reminder about some of the things that we've been through in the last 20 episodes. It is a huge scope of time and changing society to cover, and inevitably we only have relatively few snapshots. You may have noticed that I've not included a specific play so far, and, spoiler alert for the top five next time, there isn't a single play listed in my top ten. The simple reason for this is that I don't think that there is a single Roman play that influenced the theatre in Rome or after so strongly that it would deserve a place on this list in its own right. No one work of Terence, Plautus or Seneca stands out in that way, and Roman mime and pantomime are not preserved in a way that enables us to make a detailed textual study. For the Greeks, I would be happy to make an argument to include Agamemnon, Oedipus Tyrannos or the Bacchae, in such a similar list, but I can't do that for a single Roman play. So we will continue with a generalised list for the top half, which has some obvious inclusions, but I think also one or two surprises. So next time, my top five of Roman theatre, and the story of the final decline of theatre in Rome. The top five highlight the very best of Roman theatre in stark contrast to its slow and sad decline as the centuries passed. Thankfully, it was only a pause in the long story of theatrical history, so we don't have to be too distressed about it, but it is a sorry tale nonetheless. I look forward to your company next time. If you would like to support the podcast, please find us on patreon.com or go to ko-fi.com to leave me a tip and just to say thanks. And I'd like to say hello to the new Patreons who are, I hope, enjoying several additional episodes on subjects close to Greek and Roman theatre that I've produced there. If you'd like to hear more about characters like Aristotle or Socrates or an alternative view of the experience of the Greek theatre, then please head over to Patreon and search for the History of European Theatre podcast there. There'll be more episodes published there shortly, which are all immediately available to you as soon as you sign up. I'd also like to say a special hello and thanks to the many new listeners that have joined us recently. Many of you have come through hearing my piece on Christopher Marlowe on the History of England podcast, But for anyone who's not had a listen to that yet, please do head on over there. It's available on their podcast feed and from their website. And if you have a spare moment, please take a couple of minutes to rate the podcast and write a review on Apple Podcasts to help other theatre and history buffs find us. As we near the end of season two, it would be great to have a few more reviews up there. Any and all support helps offset the cost of running the podcast and is gratefully received. Thank you so much for your support, and if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. (laughs) 